I am super excited to have Kim Ironman, a book author of a very important and exciting book, um, super inspirational to me being a Monarch Way Station, um, called the, um, the Victory Pollinator Garden. And Pollinator Victory Garden. All right, sorry. <laughs> the other way. <laughs> Garden. Yeah. But I'm curious from your perspective, what inspired your book? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and hi, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us today. So I've been talking about uh, pollinators for a very long time because uh, the uh, numbers just did not look very good. And uh, for many years, the only thing we really spoke about when we spoke about pollinators were non-native honeybees. Right. We knew those populations were crashing, but there wasn't a lot of uh, press coverage on uh, native pollinators. So I started um, this campaign, as it were, uh, a number of years ago called the Pollinator Victory Garden to try to get people more interested in, uh, in the topic. And the way that it happened, I was working with a, a PR person at the time, and I'm like, how do we get people excited? And she kept challenging me. And I'm like, oh, there's got to be a way to like, I don't know, to think historically what was important that got people motivated. And I thought, hmm, Victory Gardens, Victory Gardens of World War One and World War Two. That's what got people excited, a way to participate in the war effort uh, by gardening for food defense. And it was a really brilliant marketing strategy on behalf of not only our government, but the government in a number of countries. So that's how it all came about. So I've been um, talking about this subject for many years. And then lo and behold, a couple of years ago, I got approached by a publisher and they said, would you like to write a book? Of course, I'd like to write a book. <laughs> so here we have the book. And that the picture behind me is uh, from the cover of my book. Absolutely. And it is certainly one that's in my library as a pollinator gardener. Um, I got interested in pollinator gardening, ironically, because I'm a Southern gardener who moved to the Northeast mm. and with a very late spring frost of May 15th, typically here in this zone, I had to figure out a way to juice my garden. And so um, growing up in North Carolina, I was one of 12 grandchildren and my granddaddy always grew an acre vegetable garden. And so what he told me as a little girl was that the years that his honeybees did well, his garden did well. Mm -hmm. I just sort of put that two and two together of, okay, I had this condensed growing season. How can I attract more pollinators into my garden? Now I can't grow, have honeybees where I live, but I thought if I could put some pollinator plants in between my vegetables, perhaps I could juice my garden and mm -hmm. get more yield. That first season was so successful, Kim, mm. that I was knocking on my neighbor's doors going, if you don't take these, I'm ringing the door. I <laughs> have too much. This, it was just <laughs> overwhelming right. how many squash and tomatoes right. that I had. So I think what, you know, one thing we can learn is that <clears throat> if you can attract pollinators and you're a vegetable garden, you can actually grow a lot more food, right? Well, it's, it's beyond that though, you know, because about 80% of all flowering plants on earth require animal pollination. I mean, that's huge. About a third of the food that we eat requires animal pollination, not just bees. And um, in the case of some crops, I mean, think about like tomatoes, for example, um, even if they don't require an animal pollinator, they benefit from it in terms of increased yield, better uh, quality, et cetera. Um, I did an interview, um, I have a little video snippet of it um, on my website, ecobeneficial.com, but I did an interview with a really interesting orchardist. A guy's name is John Hayden. He's in Vermont and he has a place called The Farm Between, which always hurts my head, but it's called The Farm Between. And he's a smart guy, so he's growing all these different fruits and uh, he is trying to create habitat for uh, native bees while he's doing this. And it's just really smart work. This is the way we used to think about farming. <laughs> how do we attract pollinators? Not, you know, how do we cart millions of non-native honeybees from uh, this part of the country to another part of the country? So our agriculture really needs to change. We really need to start thinking about regenerative farming instead of the hor horrendous monoculture uh, crop model that we use now, which is so environmentally harmful. Right. And I certainly, as a clinical researcher by day, the data that he is doing in his own orchard 
there's there's research to support this. I'm so, sure there is. <laughs> Rutgers University just released a study here that involves Pennsylvania apple orchards last mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And they found that by incorporating pollinator wildflower strips in right. apple orchards, our native bees, which we have 400 in this state, are mm -hmm. adding $1 billion yeah, in the apple economy. So, sure. you know, it, but so I'm 100% in agreement with you. And yeah. we're starting to see more pollinator wild wildflower strips, right. native flower strips to, in, you know, increase the presence of pollinators. Right. And, and farmers, to align farmers with this is really important. It's not just a, a backyard gardeners and front yard gardeners, but uh, the blue orchard mason bee um, is arguably the best pollinator of uh, our apples. <laughs> so they're incredibly efficient relative to uh, honeybees. Yet, what do we do? We cart honeybees in by trucks instead of creating the habitat that blue orchard mason bees need. They can be managed, but not the same way that honeybees can be managed. Right. Our native bees are much different than our than than uh, non-native honeybees. But um, yeah, I mean, every effort, whether it's commercial, whether it's um, homeowner, is really important. Even getting pollinator gardens in at your local school and the church and the library and the town hall and it, you know, it's endless where these habitats uh, can uh, be be placed and have beautiful gardens at the same time. Absolutely. And I think that's really important to think about is whether you've got a pot, whether you've got a, just a, a little hell strip between you and the street, Right. small area can make a yeah. massive difference. So yesterday I was meeting with a township locally here who are looking at putting in ordinances for invasive plants. And, you know, the conversation started with a councilman going, I hate goldenrod. Goldenrod looks terrible in lawns. And I know how you feel about goldenrod. I feel the same way. And I'm like, well, let's talk about that. Yeah. And we went from that extreme to in 30 minutes, them fast and furious taking notes and talking about how we can actually turn that whole township into mm. a pollinator pathway. And so, oh. you know, people are really like I am passionate about what you're doing and you want to incorporate some ideas to attract these native bees and pollinators to your yard how do you recommend people get started well um I, I'll, I'll give you the obvious answer pick up a cup in my book okay so that was that was a softball <laughs> I had to say that one right but actually i wrote the book so even if you hadn't really done much gardening it'd be pretty clear the steps that you need to take to get this done and if you've done a lot of gardening there's still a lot of information in there that you might not be aware of like a little factoid i i threw out about um you know reproduction of flowering plants on earth but um i talk about all the uh, different types of pollinators and uh, what they require and um, that we have these evolutionary uh, relationships between different types of pollinators and, and plants uh, called um, pollination syndromes. And these are not cast in stone, but they're pretty good guides to um, you know, what a particular pollinator might be looking for. So if um, you're like me and you love to see hummingbirds and you appreciate the pollination service they provide, then um, in the Northeast where I'm located, I'm, I'm actually located in Westchester County, uh, New York, just above uh, Manhattan. So you're thinking about um, when's their migration? When are they coming back? And what should I be planting to accommodate them? So our first native plant around here is uh, Aquilegia canadensis, our native Canada. Well, it says Canada columbine, but it's native here in Northeast too, but uh, Canada columbine. Um, so thinking in those terms. So um, as far as steps, I, I think really getting um, getting some knowledge about the pollinators that could be around you is a really good first step. What are the regional bees and butterflies and moths and so on that I could be attracting? And what do they need? So in the case of butterflies and moths, we're thinking not just about floral resources, but we're thinking about larval host plants. Their, their caterpillars require the uh, leaves of particular plants. In the case of you know, some butterfly and moth caterpillars, it's very, very specific, like um, obviously the monarch and milkweed connection. Monarch caterpillars are obligate feeders of milkweed plants, Asclepius. There are a lot of different milkweed species, but that's it. But when I ask, um, particularly when I'm in person, not on Zoom, it's a lot easier to have a dialogue with your audience when you're in person. I ask the question, can somebody name 
another native plant and what it's the larval host for. And usually it takes a while for people to think about it. So right. it's not top of mind. So right. if we start thinking about what are the creatures that could be around us and possibly now are, what do they need? What do they need in terms of um, habitat? Where do they need to live? Where do they need to nest? Where do they need to rest? Do they need a water source? What are the floral resources that need that they need and the types of flowers, the color, the floral structure, the time of bloom and so on. So it's, um, you know, it's, it gets fairly complicated when you just talk about it randomly, but sitting down with, you know, um, checklists, which I include in my book, really can be helpful to you. So you start to think about the possibilities. But for me, the easiest place to start is the big green desert. It's our lawns, our non-native turf lawns. That's the easy place to steal from in terms of creating your first pollinator garden or maybe your second or your third or your fifth. And um, a couple benefits there. Well, first of all, turf is an ecological wasteland. That's why I call it a, a green desert. Um, so it really isn't um, uh, supporting your environment. And you, we all have an ecosystem, whether we want to think of it that way or not. Our yards are ecosystems. They're just small. Um, so think about um, how much of that lawn you can live without, right? If you're playing on it, your kids are on it, your dog's on it, you're entertaining on it, keep that part, manage it organically, but designate a part of that, um, that green desert to become a pollinator island. So that's an idea that I talk about in my book. And um, one of the benefits is Turf's a monoculture, so it's been suppressing a lot of weeds for a long time. So it's a lot easier when you start from scratch with turf than, say, if you were trying to transition in a highly invaded um, area filled with invasive plants. Um, and um, start as large or as small as you like. My general rule of thumb is, for any pollinator garden, I want to see at least three plants that are native, that are in bloom, at any given time throughout the growing season, and preferably ones that have different characteristics for different types of pollinators. Mm -hmm. So now I want, I want to think about, well, in my garden, what is available for hummingbirds? What's available for the very tiny little native bees that we have? How about the bigger bees, like the bumblebees, and the carpenter bees? How about the butterflies that we're starting to see, you know, a lot, a lot of butterflies um, now, and we'll see more and more as the season progresses. Um, and then, you know, maybe if I get lucky, I'll see a daytime flying moth, like a clear wing moth, or maybe I'll be out at night and I'll see, you know, nighttime moth. And, and, um, and then I, I love wasps. Wasps are, are amazing creatures. Most of our native wasps are predatory and they keep our pest insects down. And then we have um, parasitizers. These are parasitic wasps that also do the same job in terms of um, keeping pests down. And um, particularly the uh, solitary wasps, you'll see them out um, looking for nectar a source. So plants like our mountain mints, oh, they love that. <laughs> so we want wasps in the, in the garden. And depending on where we live, I don't think we have any people from the Southwest on this, uh, uh, this uh, call, but if we do, well, you're lucky enough to have three um, species of pollinating bats in, in the Southwest. Um, they're not, we have over 50 species of bats in North America, but only three are pollinators. And so they're pollinating down there things like um, Sororo cactus and organ pipe cactus and agave and so on. So, um, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of a quick deep dive <laughs> into how I start thinking about this. So, so you said a couple of really important things. I mean, one thing is to, you know, obviously take into account where you are from and try to buy plants that are native to your area. Right. Uh, there's some fantastic guides online. And I, obviously your book is a great source for this too, for um, understanding where you might purchase those. These probably are not going to be found at your big box stores, probably going to be found with your local native plant nurseries. And we can certainly give you some resources for that. Um, happy to do that. You mentioned milkweed, and I do want to mm -hmm. just say a shout out for anybody that's following us on Facebook or here backstage. If you need milkweed, um, because of the devastating fires in the Southwest last year and the hot heat, uh, we are down 1 billion stalks of milkweed. So everyone can add this to their garden. And I have both swamp and common milkweed, and I'm very happy to share seeds. They've been in my refrigerator, so they've been uh, climatized and happy to put those in the mail to you. Um, but I will say, you know, one thing that I, I highly talk about too is 
sort of that symphony of blooms. We don't just want everything to bloom at one time and then there's nothing else for that pollinator to eat. So when you're talking about some of the early things that you mentioned, um, with, like the native, um, um, uh, you've said it now, I'm blanking on it, sorry about well, that. Here in the Northeast, um, you know, we're thinking in woodland gardens about spring ephemerals as some of right. our, our early bloomers. And then of course, some early blooming trees like red maple and uh, pussy willow and so on. But it, it is, you've brought up a good point. It's extremely important to um, think uh, regionally, think locally, really thinking about your eco region, which you can look up. It's kind of dull term, but look it up on the EPA and kind of see where you are. So it's always about right plant, right place. And your, you know, your pollinators may have evolved with different critters than my pollinators. Uh, yeah, excuse me, with different plants than my pollinators. So, um, and then of course, like any kind of good gardening, you want to put the right plant in the right place. And you've got to do a soil a soil test. It's absolutely essential. I have clients all the time who argue with me, I don't need to do a soil test. Yeah, you do. Um, and a full site analysis. But let, let's just comment on the soil test right now. Where do you do that? Don't get one of those home kits. What I suggest is you send your soil sample into your local agricultural extension, do a proper test. And you want to see things like soil pH, how acid or alkaline is your soil. You want to see if you've got, um, you know, a, a soil texture uh, of sandy or, uh, or clay or sandy loam, which is kind of typical around here. And that'll give you some clues about what wants to grow there. You want to see how much, um, what percentage of organic matter you have. Um, can you grow plants that need a lot of fertility or, you know, plants that, that don't? Um, do you have a really big imbalance of macro or micronutrients? I don't sweat that stuff too much unless it's super out of balance, but understanding your soil. And, and the other thing that you um, typically will find out through a soil test is do you have uh, lead? So I just had a client recently who's saying, you know, I just don't have time. I've, you know, I've got three kids and I've got a job and I'm like, you got to do the soil test. He said, well, just come, come do a site visit with me and then I'll do it. So I usually don't do that. I usually demand of a client that you get the soil test done first before I come to see you. Right. And I usually do like a two hour site analysis with a client, talk about every aspect that you can imagine um, of the landscape. So uh, she got the, the soil test done after we met and uh, came back with levels of lead that I have never seen before in all the years I've, I've done this, like 10 times the maximum number for New York State. She's got little toddlers playing in that soil. Uh -huh. Not time for a garden. Yes. Yeah, Time for soil remediation. So that's kind of a dramatic example, but don't take soil tests for granted. Yeah. But uh, it's all about putting the right plant in the right place. And um, why do we focus on native plants? Because of evolution. I mean, it's simple as that. Right. Um, for example, 25% of our native bee species um, are specialists on the pollen of particular plants. Right. So if we are not growing those plants. We don't support the pollinators or the plants, right? right. Um, some research has shown that... Um, uh, in, in some cases, you know, native pollinators have a very strong preference for local native plants. Now, having said that, you know, um, bees and butterflies are opportunistic feeders. So if you don't have the native plants they've evolved with, they'll feed on any invasive plant that you have. I mean, you see this all the time. Doesn't make it a good plant. Um, you probably know Japanese knotweed. That seems to be our Godzilla of invasive plants. And I I have beekeepers tell me, oh, we love Japanese knotweed. It's such a good plant for our bees. Well, it's a terrible plant for the environment. Right. So, you know, part of this is just getting nature back in balance. Right. So you brought something up, you know, that certainly these plants have evolved with specific pollinators. And that's why it's so important because it's like, you know, a kid, if you put good food in front of them, they will eat it if there's not a choice, right? But if you don't have but anything but potato chips. Not if it's liver. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I drew the line as a kid. All right, fair enough. I'll, I'll take that. I don't want to play the liver either. But I think, um, you know, one of the challenges that I get, and we actually had a question here backstage that's an excellent one. So what about cultivars? You know, certainly right. there are people that, you know, are trying to get people interested. They see this right. evolution of, all right, we've got gardeners interested in native plants. Now let's try to make it fancy and double the bloom. 
what do you, what's your thought on in cultivating or incorporating cultivars in the garden? Right. And so for those of you who are not quite sure what we're talking about, so um, let's just use coneflower as an example, Echinacea purpurea. So when you see a straight species plant, you know, um, that botanical name is going to have typically two parts. Sometimes they get a little fancier and there's a variety or subspecies, but by and large, it's you know, this binomial name, the genus and the specific epithet making the species. So Echinacea purpurea, coneflower, that's the species. So you might go to the garden center and, um, and you see something else that follows that name. You see a single quotes, Echinacea purpurea, single quote, pink double delight, single quote. Now you're in cultivar territory. Some of these are actually hybridized, uh, not just selected. And so what's, what's the big deal? What's the problem? Well, you know, it, it, our environment is in a um, pretty severe crisis, right? If, if I were doing a presentation for you right now, I'd be showing you numbers about invertebrate decline and vertebrate decline, which are extraordinary within you know, the last 50 years. It's just ridiculous. It's so bad. And climate change is making things even worse. So one of our greatest tools as um, homeowners and gardeners and landscapers and designers is uh, biodiversity, juicing up the diversity of species because we're losing so many species, you know? Um, so when we start to use plants that are not um, straight species, the straight species plants have great genetic diversity. Um, we um, start to limit that genetic diversity and, and worse, Many native cultivars, AKA nativars, many native cultivars are grown asexually, either from a cutting or a tissue culture primarily. And that results in a genetic clone. So we all remember Dolly the sheep, remember Dolly? Right. <laughs> okay. Do you want lots of Dolly the sheeps in your, your Dolly's the sheep? I'm not sure how to make not that Not ideal, especially. Right. With right. And so what? Right. What happens then? Say there's a pest or disease that hits that particular plant species and we are all planting the same cultivars. Well, poof, gone. We're actually making the situation uh, a bit worse. Right. So um, there are some native cultivars that are grown from seed. Um, very hard to get that information. I will tell you right now. <laughs> you can, but you got to do a lot of digging and most places that are selling plants aren't growing them. So they can't even tell you. Um, but um, you know, as far as attractiveness to pollinators, the simple answer is it, it depends. It depends on the plant. Right. So uh, some years ago, I did a series of interviews there. You can see these, these video clips on my website with uh, Dr. Annie White, who is then getting her PhD at the University of Vermont. And she was um, studying the relative attractiveness to pollinators of straight species native plants versus native cultivars. And the answer is sometimes it matters a lot. Sometimes it doesn't matter that much. But here's what I tell folks. If you can get straight species plants, if you can find them and they will fit in your garden, that should be first choice. If you can't, buy cultivars that look like the mother plant, <laughs> that have some resemblance to what it is you're trying to accomplish. Now, sometimes when we dwarf plants down, it can really have a negative impact. I mean, I have never come across a dwarf Monarda that's worth buying. Never. And to your uh, point about coneflowers, years ago, I bought a coneflower that is sort of like a, you know, a fiesta red, I think is what it called. Mm. And what I noticed in my pollinator garden is no one visited it oh, at all. And right. it was surrounded by other native plants. So while it was really attractive because it's this bright red color. To us. <laughs> to us, to humans. Just totally, right, right. They totally dissed it, if you want right. to say it. They just did not right. pay any attention to. That's been my experience with cultivar. I've also read some research that if they're manipulating the the leaf itself and making it striped or you know some weird color, again, not attracted to pollinators, and has been my experience as well uh, with a Joe Pie where it's a striped version. The pollinators mm, absolutely variegated, yeah, and that goes with uh, purple colored leaves too, which actually deters feeding of uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars. If we're talking about a particular host plant, so there, there's so many things we don't know, and yet we pretend like we do. Oh, you know, I see lots of pollinators on these plants. Well, I will be happy to take you to many different landscapes that I've visited and show you how pollinators are utilizing some of the worst invasive plants that we have. 
right. that are proliferating um, because it's there. Right. So um, yeah, it really does. It does make a difference. Um, but again, sometimes it makes a big difference and sometimes not. And then sometimes, you know, like you spoke about Joe Pye. So we have got a number of Joe Pye weed species that are now under the Eutochium genus. Um, you'll, you may still see them labeled as Eupatorium. So annoying, isn't it? <laughs> but um, these are great plants and boy, bees love them and butterflies love them, but they tend to be real big, real yeah, big, six feet, seven long. feet, eight feet, nine feet. Some of the species are just ginormous and they're really tough to get into a small garden. So I typically will test out some of the smaller cultivars to see how they function. Right. Um, and I'm real happy with Eutrochium dubium, uh, little Joe. It attracts a lot and a lot of, um, of a lot of pollinators. And that, that plant throws a lot of seed. Now yeah. they say it doesn't come true from seed. Ugh, you know, it seeded my itself in all of my containers on my patio. Go for it. <laughs> Four I'm, foot I'm, tall Joe Pie in all the containers, you know. <laughs> I, I planted that one last year and it's coming up everywhere, which is fine with me. Right. I have lots of other gardens I can share it with, which is not a problem. And that's the beauty of a lot of these native pollinators. Right. They're real good re reseeders. Um, and this brings up a great question about cleaning up the pollinator plants mm. as we get towards the fall. Uh, right. Certainly, this was some of the discussion I was having yesterday with this uh, township bureau is we have to redefine what we think. <laughs> is yeah, and, you know, if you're going to allow pollinator gardens, you're going to need to leave some things standing, right. as well as you're going to need to let people leave leaves. Otherwise, you're getting rid of right. butterflies. So can you talk a little bit about when you're cleaning up even the spring garden right now, why you want to leave some of these stalks for sure. your um, baby to uh, you know, lay babies in? Well, you know, I think it starts with just average people not getting well educated in school about ecological principles, right? I mean, who taught this stuff? And so we tend to think of our landscapes kind of as an extension of our our home, the interior of our homes. I've even heard designers talk about garden rooms. Oh, I, I hate that analogy because it, it's not your kitchen, your bathroom, your bedroom and the backyard. That's not how it works. So your yard may be the last vestige of um, anything that's useful to um, a lot of the creatures that we're trying to support in our ecosystem. I mean, you know, I look at my neighbors, the one neighbor on one side, well, I've convinced her she's got a great pollinator garden. The other one, it's scary. I mean, there's nothing there. There's right. nothing there. So um, my husband and I were, were taking a walk um, last fall and I saw a very ancient man with his wife watching and he was all hunched over and he had a cane on one side and a little tiny rake, you know, in the other hand. And he was trying to get the last leaf off of his lawn. I thought he was just going to like poop out and just <laughs> expire right there and he was intent you know just a lot and it's just funny I mean you know I, I was ready to see somebody bring out the vacuum and start vacuuming up the leaves so we need to loosen up folks okay if you're going to have a native garden that supports the environment around you you're going to have to loosen up you're going to have to allow, you know allow some messiness or what we've deemed as messiness because this is how nature works so when you have trees and they drop their leaves on their feet this is normal. <laughs> they, there actually is a nutrient cycling that's taking place. Those leaves are decaying and they're macro and micro invertebrates that are, are you know, eating, eating them and helping them decompose. And then they're feeding the soil. So, you know, particularly in woodland settings, having leaves um, is a really, really good thing. They don't belong in your green desert, but, you know, and if you're, you've got a prairie or a prairie scape, they don't belong there either, but you have to use a little common sense here. But um, stopping all this cleaning up is, is very important. So why? So what I tell my clients and uh, when I work with a client and it's been a crazy year, by the way, <laughs> I've had more clients this year than I've had ever in my life. So what I do is I, I give them a post-planting primer on how to manage a native garden it tells them what to do and when. And so what I instruct is in the fall, leave things alone. The, the exception is if you've got say a fungal issue on leaves, say your mat laurels are just, you know, really throwing off some bad fungus, you gotta clean that stuff up, right? But other than that, leave stuff alone. 
and let that leaf litter, let the debris in the garden uh, um, provide some habitat for overwintering invertebrates that may be there in adult form or in an immature stage. We even have species of butterflies that overwinter as adults, like morning cloak butterflies. Right. They need a place to go. So leave it be. Leave your perennials standing, your native perennials, leave your native grasses standing um, as a, a seed source for right. hungry birds. Um, um, make sure, you know, beyond that, you've got some persistent fruits in your landscape um, on plants like winterberries to, uh, to provide a meal over the winter. But um, find a beauty in all of the cool stuff that goes on in the winter in uh, your landscape. I do a, a, a class and a talk on this. It's like the off-season native garden. So many beautiful seed pods and seed heads and structure and form, bark and so on and so on. But you've got to redefine what's beautiful. And when you start thinking about the ecological functioning of these things, just not the aesthetics, then they get even more beautiful. I mean, isn't a flower more beautiful when there's a bee nectaring on it? I think so, for sure. We so think, it. yeah, so think like the- it's Very entertaining the, to go out in the garden and see yeah. flies and birds and bees. It's the activity that's part of the interest in the garden, yeah. not just the beauty of the flower. And, and, you, the and you've done that. I mean, and you've done it. I mean, it's so empowering to make a difference this way and transition a lifeless landscape into a landscape filled with life. So step back from all the cleanup. Don't be blowing your leaves. Use them as uh, as mulch. They are great mulch, and particularly in woodland gardens. You know, use some common sense. I people say, well, you know, how about the two feet of leaves? Okay, let's use some common sense, folks. Okay, spread the leaves around. You know, six inches or so. That's fine. You got two feet you know, spread them around. Um, don't shred them because you might be shredding invertebrates when you're doing that. And then in springtime, when the weather, start to get, the weather starts to get warmer and we get temperatures in the 50s, both day and night, then we start to get that in insect activity. Now, not everybody's waking up on X date, <laughs> right? So what I suggest is once the weather's warmed in that zone and the soil is not soggy, because we don't want to step on wet soil. It's the enemy of healthy soil to do that. We can compact soil in a second. That could take us years to remediate you know, through just gentle applications of compost. So don't step on wet soil, but stagger your cutting back over a period of weeks. Start with this section this week and that section the next week and so on and so on and so on. And um, I like to leave some stubble. And uh, particularly if I think, well, maybe like a pithy or hollow stem plant like a Joe pie weed, like an elderberry might be housing a critter. So we can leave some stubble up to you how tall you want to make it. Some people have a very low threshold of tolerance for <laughs> plant stubble, but you know, four inches, six inches, whatever. And um, uh, a friend of mine who's also a collaborating photographer on my book and a fabulous person that you should interview is Heather Holm. She's written a number of books on bees and her latest one is on wasps. So Heather um, was kind enough to collaborate with me on the photography for my book. And uh, she lives out in the Midwest and she's using plant stubble as a way to deter deer. Nice and pokey and tall. Really smart idea. Yeah. That they lean down to take a bite of your food and then a bite of a plant Ouch. And <laughs> face like a <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah. And I don't know, like you know, walking around in that stubble must be unpleasant. So I think that's genius. I'm not sure there's any research that proves anything, but it sure makes common sense. So we can do that. But um, you know, just being gentle in the garden and really having an appreciation for uh, the creatures that are there. Uh, gentle, gentle, gentle is what I say. And uh, if in doubt, leave it. Uh, absolutely. And so I did that this year on purpose because I host a lot of native bees, especially ground dwelling bees and mason bees. Mm -hmm. I can see the mason bees have already started to fill up some of those holes. I can see things like sticking out of the stubble, as you call it. What? Really within weeks, almost everything is covered up. I can't, you can't actually see those. Right, right. Yeah. Things. Just give it time. You won't see it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What I cut off the top, I made piles and I have seen the birds come and take it and make nests out of it. So nice. it's cycled in the garden. So this brings up a great question too. We've been talking a lot about bees, but you know, nature's hot dogs, the caterpillars are also really important this time of year because of mm -hmm. all the nestlings. So can you talk a little bit about the plants that we should think about that host these caterpillars right. to feed our bee birds? So, you know, if you start, 
researching um, native host plants, you will be surprised how many there are. Now, I've got a kind of a quick cheat sheet on my website um, on ecobeneficial.com. I've got a subsection backslash PVG for pollinator victory garden. You can see all sorts of downloads of plant lists and so on. And I just want to throw out a cautionary um, comment. Do not rely on one plant list, Agreed. even if it's mine. <laughs> Cross reference, check, make sure that you're getting the right plants for you know your situation. But um, so we have many woody plants, trees and shrubs and vines that are host plants. But we also have a, you know quite a few perennial plants that are host plants too. Like I said, you'd be surprised how many you come across when you start doing um, some research. But uh, I'll defer to the wonderful work by Dr. Uh, Doug Tallamy from University of Delaware, um, the author of uh, a book I make every student of mine read, Bringing Nature Home. Um, he's got other great books, including Nature's Best Hope, a new book on oaks. Read them all, but start with Bringing Nature Home. And um, what he identified in, um, in his research and published in that book, which was, of course, done in the Mid-Atlantic, the research. So he found that um, of... Um, woody plants, uh, trees and shrubs and vines, um, the top plants in terms of hosting the most, the greatest number of uh, caterpillars started with oaks. So that may be confusing because of course when, they're wind pollinated. So, you know, can we call them a, poll a pollinator plant? Well, we, we can, but we also have to know that if we only have a garden full of wind pollinated plants, we have a pollinator desert, but we got to get those host plants in too. So oaks, and then we get to prunus or plums or cherries and so on. Um, black cherry, people think of it as a weed here. When I see it, I'm so happy. When I see it in a client's landscape, that really hosts a ton of um, caterpillars. If you can't get a big old black cherry and then think about a choke cherry, prunus virginiana, also a really robust plant. And then equal in terms of the uh, caterpillar count, with prunus, our cherries and plums and related species. Um, our salix, our willows, they're really robust plants, host plants, nectar plants, and so on. And, um, and then we get down to betula, birches, and, and so on and so on. But um, you will be amazed. Uh, one of my favorite vines, which is um, uh, Lanacera sempervirens, trumpet honeysuckle, AKA Carl honeysuckle, it's a very nicely behaved, beautiful vine the hum hummingbirds love. I mean, that's a host plant. I mean, who knew? Right. But um, the more you look, the more you'll find and you'll just say, wow, I am, I'm like really being a good host by having all these host plants, <laughs> all these different creatures. One of my most favorite things I've planted in the garden is a sassafras tree. Oh, yeah. The Aren't they fun? Bush, oh, they're so much fun because the spice bush swallowtail, that's one of their host plants. Yeah. And their caterpillars are hilarious. They right. look, they are supposed to look like a snake. They don't, right. but right. they're supposed to look right. like And they'll roll up the leaves like they're in mm -hmm. a little. Mm -hmm. And so I like to unroll the leaves and take a look at it. <laughs> and, uh, so all summer, that was just like such a delight for all the people that would come to the garden because I knew they were yeah. there. And, and, and then they've got great fruit for birds. But you know what? Um, so... I, occasionally I get a really good client who lets me do a bit of a restoration, not just a pretty garden, but really like go haul hog with uh, the, the trees and the shrubs. So we're, tr I was trying to restore woodland. Do you know how hard it was to find sassafras? Oh my gosh. It is really hard. <laughs> I did. I found it, but it, it, I mean, and American beach, I mean, things that are, should be existing in our woodlands that are really tough to find. You know, go to your average garden center and ask for like a white oak. They're going to look at you like, uh, no, we don't have that. Which brings so, up a question backstage, Ken. Yeah. It's certainly been true for my experience too, which is, you know, some of these uh, native plants are really expensive. Why is that compared to a cultivar? Well, I, I don't, I, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Um, it depends where you're shopping. So if you go, if you go to a garden center that, I mean, I, I, I was referred to one in, um, in New Jersey by a client of mine in, in New Jersey. And um, I mean, their prices are like astounding. So here's the way you get around that, right? First of all, buy smaller plants. Yep. You don't need to big, other than if you're going to invest in a, um, an evergreen tree or shrub, you might want to go a little bit bigger because a lot of them can be slower growing. And in woody plants in general, I usually buy them containerized, not bald and burlapped. 
is you've got the immediate growth as opposed to losing the vast majority of the root system when they're dug to be bald and burlap. But with perennials, by and large, I'm using plant plugs. I'm using native perennial plugs for clients um, for my own garden. And so I had a, a bit of a disaster in my landscape. Uh, over time, my ancient railroad tie walls and fencing collapsed. Oh, no. So uh, yeah, it wasn't great. And, um, and I have a small landscape. I'm only 16 miles north of uh, Grand Central Station, folks. Okay, wow. I'm in like yeah. really squashed suburbia. So the whole damn thing collapsed. And, and uh, we started the work in February to rebuild it. And then the pandemic hit. So I wound up putting in um, almost all of my plants at the end of May into early June, which was later than I wanted to. And then we got a drought. But yep. the reason I'm sharing this with you is almost all my perennials that I put in were, were plugs. And most of them are full size now. That's yep. in like one year. <laughs> That, that's been my experience too, yeah. that you can get um, from some of these lo local native nurseries, um, very nice plants. Sometimes they see, may seem small when they go in mm -hmm. and I get clients that say, oh, I want a full look. I, I want a full look too, but these things are right. going to grow. So a lot of native plants sleep, creep, leap. Right. So I have that going on right now in my garden where I'm right. like, all right, it's been two years. And then all of a sudden this year, it's just whoo. They've yeah. just really, really taken off. Right. So we had a lot of snow and we had an early right. rain. So that, right. is that helped. Thing, which is a good thing. But right. I, I will say a couple of things in, in support of native plants. And this was part of my message yesterday to um, our township, which was number one, they require less maintenance, not mm. no maintenance, but less. You got it. <laughs> not no maintenance. <laughs> so they require no chemical interaction. Hard no, hard. no, no. So, you know, if you're concerned about, you know, that you're going to have children out playing on the lawn or your pets, and, you know, in my case, I have a pet who's immune compromised, so we can use no chemicals, not that I would anyway, because of my pollinators. But, you know, there's a huge push this year. We've got broad X emerging here in Pennsylvania, and people are like, oh, we have to do something. Well, guess what, folks? That is bird food and fish food. And turkey food, if you're a mm. hunter, like leave them alone. You don't need to do anything. And there are plants that you can plant that will actually deter things like mosquitoes. You don't have mm. to spray because if you're going to spray for the bad guys, you're going to take out the yeah. good guys too. But one of mm -hmm. our nurseries here locally, um, they're about two hours north, but they're great drive for me um, is um, Edge of the Woods Nursery. And oh, yeah, sure. They I did a talk things. for them several years ago on this yeah. very topic. Awesome. Mm -hmm. They grow things from seed and I can assure you. A lot you, of things, not everything. Yes. As it, for as someone who grows things from right. seed, it takes a long time. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. And there's so many things that can go wrong. Despite your best efforts, you go out of town and your husband forgets to water them. That <laughs> recently. I love him, but he didn't water the plant. So, you know, you can totally lose your seeds in a very short period of time mm. if you don't treat them perfectly. Yeah. So, so, um, but I will say what I have gotten from them, everything has grown beautifully and um, I haven't lost anything. So, right. you know, yes, it was a large investment on the front end. Right. They have some very unusual plants as well. Yeah, but, they have they have some of those things that are very hard to find. I wish they were closer to where I am, but um, yeah. <laughs> but um, you mentioned a, yeah. Uh, looking for site, so we had someone say, "I'm looking for a spice bush. Where can I find a spice?" Yeah, uh, yeah. Syracuse.org, um, Audubon, as mm -hmm. well as National Wildlife Federation, all have native plant nurseries. And Doug, since you mentioned Doug Talmy, who is a huge, I'm a huge acolyte of De Doug Talmy. Um, he has worked with his fellows to create a partnership with the National Wildlife Federation. Right. You can put in the native plant finder with your zip code, right. your ecotype, and it will tell you not only the top five plants you can plant for your zip code that will host the most pollinators, but in addition, it'll tell right. you where to buy them. 
So you can call those nurseries and say, I'm looking for. And I, and I will say this again, cautionary tale. So we want to make sure that we're cross-referencing. We want to make sure we're doing a site assessment because my landscape can be right next to your landscape and be completely different. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So hundred percent with with caution um, that is said, Um, but I, you know, definitely patronize these, these nurseries. They may not be on your traditional search engine websites. You're going to have to do a little bit of work here, Mm -hmm. but it will completely be worth it because the long-term game that I tell people is once you plant it, it comes back typically is rare that it won't unless something. Sure. And the other thing that I think we should all be doing is we should be talking to our uh, local garden centers and saying, why aren't you carrying more natives? Great. Why aren't you, you know, I'm looking for these. If you want my business, I need you to carry natives. And I'll, I'll tell you what, um, did that some years ago. It's, I think it's about 12 years ago now. Um, unfortunately, where I am, we've lost a ton of the mom and pop garden centers. Um, they've just been shut out by the big box stores, sadly. And um, we've got one really good one remaining. So about 12 years ago, um, I approached them. I'm on the uh, steering committee of our native plant center, the native plant center here in New York. And uh, I asked this garden center, would you like to do a joint sale with us once a year in September? We do our own in the spring, but would you like to do this in the fall? And uh, so what we did uh, was we provided all the volunteers. We do personal shopping. We do lectures, walk and talks with people that show up. And, uh, and they bring in a lot of the native plants they never carried. Well, we, we, double yeah. their, we double their business. We double their sales every year that we do it. And, and now people are going to that garden center to find more natives. So yeah, it, 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 it takes an approach from all sides to, uh, to make change. Absolutely. And even here locally, you know, we have uh, state organizations, townships and so forth that do these plant sales. And one of the things I brought attention to this borough yesterday was the plants that you guys are offering are not native. And they weren't even aware. <laughs> yeah. you know, so, so no more like, Kusa dogwood. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's mm. important that we do right. our part if you know. Right. And just it suggests. So I got right. asked uh, as a master gardener to come and speak at our local, I would say high end nursery. And they threw out a bunch of topics. And I said, I'm willing to talk about native pollinator plants. <laughs> and so they've done exactly what you suggested that right. I'm going to do a walk and talk that day. And I'm super excited to share my knowledge about the monarch butterflies mm-hmm. and, and how people can attract more butterflies to their garden. But mm-hmm. we certainly have some things that are really going to affect the migration this year and one of those things is that there was a late frost in in texas that killed a lot of the milkweed so the population that's coming north right now can you help people understand the sense of urgency because for monarchs this year it is a very huge sense of urgency and what they can do yeah so you know just you know, just quickly. So monarchs, you know, achieved population highs uh, in the nineties. And so we've had just huge crashes. There there are two general populations of monarchs, one that stays on the West coast, which is almost gone. Right. I think they'll probably be extinct in our lifetime, you know, or at least my lifetime. So they're almost done. And then the other population that overwinters in Mexico in (laughs) decreasing and decreasing and decreasing habitat, in the forest, uh, particular forests in Mexico. So we've got to preserve that. We've got to advocate for that forest to um, to remain intact and um, help figure out how to give folks who are trying to make money by cutting down trees uh, other ways to make their income. And then we've got to really think about um, all the farmers across the Midwest in terms of using different farming practices and thinking more about regenerative practices rather than the monoculture practices using uh, the enormous amount of glyphosate, uh, the key ingredient in Roundup, um, or, or Roundup ready uh, plants that um, they can spray and uh, are not affected. Everything else gets killed, so all that milkweed's gone. And and we can in our own gardens, um, you know, plant milkweeds and many other plants. Um, it's not just about the monarchs, folks. <laughs> We've got about 50 species of butterflies that are in big, big, big trouble in, in North America. Yeah. Um, Linda put a great uh, a tip here in the uh, chat that I want to share with our Facebook audience, which is several of the public gardens mm-hmm. near Philadelphia have plant sales one to two times a year. 
or have a native plant pop up shop. Yeah, that, that's 100% true. And typically the um, this the master gardeners like myself um, host native plant sales mm -hmm. at least once a year. Unfortunately, because of COVID, our state would yeah. that. But what we are doing is a gardens to go. So mm -hmm. all nice. of the master gardeners have donated native plants from their gardens. And mm -hmm. for $5, you can get 20 wow. plants. Which that's, is that's a great deal. <laughs> sign, <laughs> so, sign me up. Exactly, and, right? Like I'll take two. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I definitely take a look around you. It's very likely that um, you may see in your area uh, ways to obtain plants uh, mm -hmm. for little cost or, or free. I will caution you that we do have Asian jumping worms. And so uh, yeah. you don't want to obtain a new problem. Um, but um, certainly too, you know, someone's asking backstage is a couple of quick questions. One, I read the monarchs did not make the endangered species list, list this past year. Even yeah. with the what does it take? Uh, yeah. yeah, really, it, what does it take? I mean, we just got to get a lot smarter about this stuff. But yeah. Um, you know, um, I had this profound thought and I've just forgotten it. <laughs> oh, oh, I do have a profound thought. So almost every state um, has a native plant society. Join it, join it. You're gonna get so much information. In some states, the information is incredibly robust on their websites, other states, not so much. You know, here in New York, uh, the Native Plant Center, we're kind of it. But uh, the uh, Native Plant Society of New Jersey is phenomenal. I mean, there's so many um, of these Native Plant Societies and they're cheap. Botanical Societies typically um, are available as well and they're very Native focused. So, you know, join those organizations. They need your support and you'll get lots of good information about what plants to use, you know, what are appropriate regionally, where the Native Plant Sales are. A lot of them are run by nonprofits. Some of the best ones are run by nonprofits, I will I will say, yeah. um, and um, even contractors that, um, or designers like me who will work with natives only and um, help you out if you can't do it all. 100%. And, and the one thing I, I do want to share with folks, because it can be intimidating if you haven't done a lot of this stuff, you know, you don't know a plant until you've killed it. We've all killed some plants. All right. We have all done it. Um, I killed one this year. <laughs> So it's okay. It's okay. This is yeah, how you yeah. learn, right? Yeah. This is how you learn. And so, yep. you know, if you're not really <laughs> sure, don't buy like 10 of a particular plant and, you know, big pots, buy a few. I will say this, if you're buying perennials, try not to um, just buy one small perennial. We want to plant in um, groupings right. so pollinators can find them. Yeah. So like them and, and aesthetically, it's always better with threes or fives or, you know, odd numbers. But, you know, if something goes amiss and it doesn't make it, ugh, you know, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, learn that lesson. There was there was a question in the chat that, that is on wild ones too. Again, yep, uh, was saying you know what do we do in the winter time to protect these tender perennial, perennials that are native? Um, Nothing. So do you have suggestions? Yeah, we you protect them? them. No. What, so think about what happens at a nursery or garden center for all the unsold plants that they have at the end of the season, right? They stay in pots and they just get over winter. They, they die back and then they come back up in the, in the next year. Nothing. Um, leaving uh, leaves in place where appropriate is a very good idea. Being a little bit sensitive to um, plants that don't love being transplanted in fall, like our broadleafed evergreens or rhododendrons and mount laurels and so on. We've got to be a little thoughtful about planting those, plant them early, make sure they're well watered going into the winter, make sure they've got leaves on their feet like they, they like. But um, for perennials, you know, no, nothing, nothing. <laughs> they, they can take care of themselves. Yeah, they, and, they take a, a, a ticking. That's why I like about them. Unlike uh, exotics, they really don't take a whole lot of anything. Um, and if you're leaving them standing, you're not potentially yeah. exposing them. So um, so I, I leave them alone. That's, that's yeah, that's totally. Um, one organization I wanted to tell you that I joined uh, was the uh, Wild Ones. Yeah, that is a great organization. So they're awesome. And yeah. the information they put out is fabulous. So yeah. if you're looking for a garden club that is focused on natives, uh, the Wild Ones has totally delivered. And they're very good also to mm -hmm. let us know when there are going to be native plant sales or things. Right, right. 
Uh, yeah, I wrote uh, I wrote a piece on climate change and uh, native gardening for them a few years ago for the national organization. Fortunately, we don't have a chapter anywhere near me, which is really unfortunate. But maybe 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 one they're day adding, they're adding because they just added yeah. ours this year. Because I, I oh had, that's good. Uh, yeah, been following them and yeah. saw they added it and immediately joined. So you know, Kim, we've talked about you know a few things that people can certainly do. I mean, obviously. Uh, we want to support the pollinators that are here and the ones that are on their way. So converting part of the lawn. You've talked about a symphony of blooms. So things that bloom throughout the season mm -hmm. and then planting in drifts. So more than one plant. I, I, would do, I usually buy two the first year and then I see how it does yeah. and then I buy more. Um, and also because they seed themselves. <laughs> many, <laughs> so many of them do. Many of them do. Um, you know, are there any parting thoughts you have um, in the last few minutes we have with the audience that that you would say, I mean, you've certainly demonstrated a sense of urgency here, but you know, if you want to take this to the next level and, and really start thinking about being a little more mindful in your landscape and maybe replacing some of your exotics with natives, right. what are some things that people can sure. do? Sure, so a couple of things that are, are really, really important. One is we gotta skip the pesticides, okay? My book is dedicated to Rachel Carson who wrote the book Silent Spring in the early 60s. And we still haven't learned that lesson. We just gotta stop. I've been in my landscape for 27 years. I've never used a pesticide, period, end of story. It can be done. Um, and I know there are you know, some pretty big challenges, but you know, it just, we can't. A pollinator victory garden does not have pesticides. So that's number one. Um, and uh, what do we do instead? Well, we, we plant a lot of native plants, especially small flowered ones that attract beneficial insects are natural enemies that keep pests in check. A healthy garden ecosystem has an abundance of insects, but they're in balance, right? And, um, and we can be very strategic with plants. Like um, I once bought a plant from a grower, it's a hibiscus, um, native hibiscus moschutos. I mean, the interplanted allium, uh, onion, in the pot. As he said, you know, hibiscus is just notorious for getting devastated by Japanese beetle and they hate allium. Brilliant. We got to start thinking like that. Um, and um, so that's number one. And then number two is really get serious about invasive plants. I don't care that you have a burning bush that is gorgeous and huge and just fantastic looking. I don't care. I don't care if you have an autumn olive that is loaded with bees. It is time to let go and cut down and replace. We've got to get serious about invasive plants in any landscape. And I get a lot of pushback from clients because it's a lot of work, but you got to do it. You can't be an ecological steward you know, halfway with one toe in the water, you really got to be responsible. And so um, just, you know, make yourself uh, familiar with your state's invasive species list, but go beyond that. Look at the list of the states around you and also pay attention to plants that are not yet on that, on these lists, but are problematic. You can see them. The Rose of Sharon, absolutely. The Japanese Spirea, absolutely. And so on and so on. And just just get rid of them. Just, Absolutely. just get rid of them. And barberry is one here oh. that I know is on your yeah. band list, but you can buy them at our right. local nursery. I saw them over the weekend oh. and I, I wanted to take a flamethrower through them because right. during pandemic, that's what I did, Kim. I have a tiny forest behind my house and all the barberry that's in this neighborhood had moved into the forest. Yeah. Had a councilman say, but they've got such pretty berries. I'm like, yes, which birds eat and then deposit right. in the forest and then I have to go cut them right. down. So I literally, you know, uh, that was one of my ways I dealt yeah. with stress because I have, I'm married to a frontline healthcare worker and I was terrified for him and his staff. And, you know, I cut down, I can't tell you yeah. how many multi-flora rows. And right. Barberry. All the bad boys. Yep. But this year was rewarded with a carpet of spring ephemerals. So nice. The research nice. says, and I can attest, right. Take these bad guys out and the good guys yeah. move back in because they finally have room yeah. to grow. And and the, the clients that tell me, but I never see them seat around. <laughs> <laughs> Please come in my tiny forest. You are you are lying to yourself. Um, taking them out. Yeah. Um, just just that's... moved a couple hundred rows of Sharon seedlings from a quarter acre landscape. Yeah. So yeah, they do. But um, so yeah. And then and just last of all enjoy this process. It is so fulfilling and empowering to be able to affect change in a positive way. There's so few occasions in your life 
when you have um, an action that is a direct positive consequence. So seize the moment and do it. Go out there and plant something. Make sure it's native though. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous advice. And I am so grateful you've dropped so many pearls here and inspired all of us, including me, to go out and do more. So thank you so much for being Thank you. Here. Um, if you want to get a copy of Kim's book, we've been putting the link in the chat, but certainly I'd love to direct them to you of how to contact you if they would like sure. to get information. You just go to ecobeneficial.com. I've got a contact form and just get in touch. Absolutely. And certainly if you'd like to know more about uh, learning how to garden thoughtfully, uh, I have a new YouTube channel and I put up videos there all the time. There is a new sea starting guide that I just put up a class on and it's free. You're welcome to join us there if you would like to learn more about growing things from seed. So thank you again, Kim. We thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now.